Hi everyone and welcome to our Biodiversity Net Gain talk. This is our second talk in our series on this topic and we'll be looking at the metric for calculation tool today. So this follows on from the last talk which was an introduction to Biodiversity Net Gain and um, so we'll introduce ourselves. I'm Will Meliwish and this is Jack Catamol and today we will be um, giving a little bit of a refresher to the Biodiversity Net Gain legislation which we covered in the last talk. Um, and this will involve a bit of a recap of the multiplies, which is really key for understanding how biodiversity net gain will be implemented in England. Um, we will then go through a fully worked out example um, so you can see how the metric is applied. And then once we've gone through this, we will um, have a little bit more um, of some discussion points um, around the metric, such as irreplaceable habitat, what happens on small sites, and what are the implications of biodiversity net gain isn't achieved. So without further ado, I will hand over to Jack to go through the metric for tool. Hi everyone, so as Will mentioned, uh, my name is Jack Katamol. Um, uh, yes, I'll be doing a little refresher of biodiversity net gain legislation. Um, so we will start that now. So biodiversity net gain, um, it says here it's being introduced from November 2023. The government actually announced at the end of last month that there will be a two month delay to this now. Um, so this will actually come into force now in January 2024. Um, it's still being enforced under the Environment Act 2021. And um, biodiversity net gain will apply to all developments which are located in England, are taking place above the mean low water level and are greater than 25 meters squared in size. Um, so the biodiversity net gain objectives can be achieved um, by providing at least a 10% biodiversity net gain as part of development projects. This can be achieved through habitat creation, enhancement, or through the purchase of biodiversity credits, and it must be sustained for at least 30 years. So just to give a bit of a recap about the multipliers as well, in terms of our pre-development biodiversity value, uh, we take into account the size of our habitat, which is measured in hectares. And then we also consider distinctiveness, condition, and strategic significance as part of this. Um, so those with a bit more of an ecological background uh, will, might have quite a good understanding of what these words mean. But for those who don't, habitat distinctiveness is a, is a measure of how significant a habitat type is for biodiversity in a national context. And this can be used as rarity or other priorities. Um, habitat condition is a measure of habitat quality, and this typically relates to how well the habitat is being managed, but can also refer to structural features such as percentage cover of undesirable species. And strategic significance um, depends on whether a habitat parcel falls within a strategic biodiversity area, which has been identified in local policy. So when we go on to think about uh, post-development biodiversity value, we take into account the four multipliers used to determine the pre-development biodiversity value, and we also consider the time to target condition measured in years, the difficulty of achieving this, and the spatial risk. The spatial risk only refers to offsite mitigation and offsetting, and all of these must be signed to score by a competent person, which will typically be an ecologist or someone with a significant ecological background. So moving on to metric four, when you first open the calculation tool for the first time, this is the page that you'll be greeted by. Uh, this must be filled out with all the relevant details of your project. And you'll also notice that you must state if there are any irreplaceable habitats present on the site at the baseline. And I'll come back to this a little bit later on. So this is the main menu interface of metric four. As you can see, hedgerows and watercourse biodiversity values are determined separately to that of area. In order for this talk not to be too long, um, I'll just be focusing on area habitat creation and enhancement. Now, hedgerow and watercourse data can be input similarly to that of area, but relies on linear units rather than area data. When we click on the on-site area habitat baseline, this is the page that will be displayed. So there are a few things to note here. Firstly, the area habitat summary box at the top of the screen. Um, this will update as the data is input into the metric. Um, the second row of this total net percentage change is essentially your biodiversity net gain percentage. Now you'll notice as well at the bottom of the screen we have various tabs including instructions, main menu and results, as well as tabs for inputting data regarding habitat creation or enhancement to determine biodiversity net gain. We also have columns that are highlighted in yellow 
These columns are automatically filled out with values depending on data input into the metric. So I'll explain this a bit more shortly. In the headings row, we've got the multipliers distinctiveness, condition, and strategic significance, which are used to determine the pre-development biodiversity value, otherwise known as the baseline. So in our previous talk, we said that we would demonstrate a work through example of how biodiversity net gain could be achieved using ecological engineering. We discussed last time that these hard structures can feature grooves, cups, and pit habitats, which mimic the attributes of locally found habitats subsequently increasing the complexity of coastal defence structures which facilitate biocolonisation. For this example, we will assume that 100 square metres of conventional seawall must be replaced. The seawall has been in place for a number of years and has become degraded over this time. And in this situation, provided that the shoreline management plan has remained unchanged, it's very likely that you would want to replace the seawall. And this is a few examples of some of the interventions which can be added into these structures. So we're now going to input the data of our seawall replacement into the metric. Uh, the first thing that we must input is the broad habitat type, which is being impacted. Um, in this case, it is the intertidal hard structures. And within this category, there are also three subcategories, which are artificial hard structures, artificial features of hard structures, and artificial hard structures with integrated greening of great infrastructure which I will now refer to as artificial hard structures with Iggy. So for the sake of making it easy to visualize, I've taken screenshots of parts of the metric. Um, a conventional seawall would fall under the habitat type artificial hard structure, and 100 square meters corresponds to 0 0.01 hectares. So we've input this value as well. Scrolling on to the next columns, we can see that the data in the yellow highlighted cells has been filled out automatically. This has been determined from the input habitat type. Artificial hard structures are assigned a distinctiveness score of low, which corresponds to a score of two. The condition of a habitat depends on five different indicators. These must be determined by a competent person who must assign a score of good, moderate, or poor for each of the five indicators. And this will give us a maximum score of 15 if all indicators are assigned a score of good. When thinking about our conventional sea wall, the coastal processor score will be low, as will the amount of colonisation, just due to the nature of an artificial sea wall. We have assumed an overall condition of moderate for this example. Strategic significance values are also automatically assigned, depending on whether the habitat type has been identified in local strategy. If a baseline habitat type has been identified in local strategy, a higher significance score is assigned, which increases the baseline biodiversity value of the site. You will notice that for the conditions to be met, the same distinctiveness or better habitat is required. And the purpose of this is to discourage and penalize developments on sites with high distinctiveness habitat present. The total habitat units for the baseline is determined to be 0.04 habitat units. And because the seawall is being replaced, all these habitat units are lost. So this is what the spreadsheet should look like when all the relevant data has been input and we've been able to work out the baseline or pre-development biodiversity value. We are now going to move on to on-site habitat creation. So in the same way that we determined the on-site habitat baseline, we begin determining the on-site habitat creation by inputting the broad habitat type. This time the broad habitat type is still inside of our structures, but the proposed habitat type is artificial structures with integrated greening of gray infrastructure. This habitat type is assigned a higher distinctiveness score than artificial hard structures, being classed as having a medium distinctiveness, which corresponds to a score of four. Moving on to condition, the higher biocolonization potential of Iggy means that it should score more highly in the amount of colonization condition category. This has the potential to tip this into being rated good condition, which is what has been input into the metric. The strategic significance score is likely to be the same as for the habitat baseline, as many councils and local planning authorities do not currently include mention of Iggy in local strategy. This is therefore assigned a low strategic significance. Next, we have something a little bit different. Because it is within a column which is highlighted yellow, the data has been automatically determined by the metric, which provides a standard time to target condition of 13 years. 
and also allows for the user to state if there's been any habitat creation in advance or alternatively if there will be any delay in starting habitat creation. This is used to derive a final time to target multiplier, which is applied with a few other multipliers such as difficulty of achieving to give us the habitat units which will be delivered from this habitat creation. So this is the area habitat summary from the data which we've input into the metric. We can see that we've achieved our biodiversity net gain objectives. We've got our percentage increase of 26.49%. This exceeds the required 10%. We can see that our trading rules have been satisfied. We've not got any high distinctiveness habitats being replaced by lower distinctiveness habitats. And our area check is also acceptable. So the area that we've degraded and affected as part of development has been uh, mitigated and put back into place. Now, you'll remember that we stated that our target habitat type was not included in the local strategy, um, but it could actually make quite a big difference to our final biodiversity net gain percentage. So the only thing that we have changed in the metric um, to calculate these two values is that we've stated that the habitat type we are creating has been identified in the local strategy for the second box as opposed to the first box. And we can see just how big of a difference this can have. Um, on our final biodiversity net game percentage. So I'm going to hand over to Will again to uh, wrap up the presentation and just cover a few key points. Thanks, Jack. That makes us on nicely to talk about some of the discussion points around the biodiversity net game metric. So I think it's really interesting to see how just the change of one multiplier can have a really big impact on the final biodiversity units that are produced, um, and also highlights the importance of local strategy in incentivizing or potentially even disincentivizing specific methods of achieving biodiversity net gain. So another really important point to consider, um, particularly in the intertidal environment, um, is how the metric is applied to small sites. So uh, you may recall that um, the net gain applies to all sites over 25 meters squared. However, for small sites, that's more than one hectare, there has been a separate metric that has been developed. Um, Similar to the main metric, this has been delayed and actually will not come into force until April in 2024. Um, there are some important points to remember with the small metric, um, particularly as it's a much more simplified version. Uh, and, and this is to sort of um, make it more easy to implement practically where there are several um, small scale projects taking place. So there are fewer habitat types to select and some of the categories within the different multipliers are reduced as well. And this is particularly important when looking at the condition assessment. Um, and this is mostly because when you look at the factors that are included in the condition assessment, they mostly only really come into play at a landscape scale. So this is something like um, water quality or coastal processes in the, in the tidal environment. And as you can imagine, um, you're very unlikely to see a significant impact on those factors from a, a site that's 25 meters squared or so. This is really important to remember um, in the intertidal environment where, where you're not likely to have those large scale developments like you might in, in the terrestrial um, environment. One other important thing to mention with the small site metric is that there aren't any options for offsetting with this tool. And um, this means that if this is something you want to look at as part of your project, it's actually recommended that you use the main site metric so that you can fill this in. Um, this is also the case with some of the factors that I've previously mentioned, such as the condition assessment, are particularly important to this project. Um, and you can see with, with the example that we used, um, we used a larger site metric even for a site that was less than one hectare, and this is actually recommended in many cases. So if we look at irreplaceable habitats, um, these are habitats that have a very high distinctiveness score and can only be um, mitigated uh, with bespoke compensation measures which are determined on a site-by-site -site basis. So you can't replace these within the metric tool um, and that's just to ensure that you don't have a, a situation where um, really important habitats are being replaced by less important habitats um, even if they're at a, a larger scale. Um, so they also can't be com compensated for through biodiversity credits either. Uh, so you can't just um, purchase those credits from Natural England to justify the, um, the, the depletion of uh, irreplaceable habitat. There is still some consultation ongoing regarding this. 
particularly um, as to which habitats or classes are replaceable. Um, but in the intertidal environment, this is, like, this is likely to be um, things like sand dunes or salt marshes of a particularly high quality. If we quickly mention some of the discussion around the implications of biodiversity net gain isn't met. So as you might recall from our earlier talk, um, the project is expected to submit regular, re regular reports over the 30 years for which the biodiversity units are guaranteed. Um, within this time period, there is a certain acceptable failure that can be assigned. This is where the best efforts have been made to achieve biodiversity net gain. The monitoring has taken place as promised, and there have been the best efforts to bring it back to achieve the initial um, proposed biodiversity net gain. However, if this hasn't happened, core action may be taken um, where there has not been any attempt to achieve the biodiversity net gain that was laid out in the initial net gain plan. So at that planning stage, um, there will be a legal agreement which will outline the outcomes um, for failure if the biodiversity net gain is not taken in, into account. So that brings us to the end of this presentation. Hopefully you found that um, very useful. Um, if you have any questions or any points you want to raise with us, then feel free to get in touch via email um, or even give us a call and we'll try our best to, to fill those questions as best we can. So thanks very much for listening, everyone. And I'm sure we will speak to you on future calls.